I mean, actually, in these moments of darkness, uh, that is what they say, telling truth is a revolutionary act, and it's hope. So, over to you, VJ, because many of us say we're fighting the same fight again and again and again. There was a conversation yesterday, will this fight ever end? Will this fight ever end? Well, first, Asad, thanks for um, forcing me to come to Glasgow. Uh, when I walk the streets of cities like this, you know, Glasgow was the UK's second most important city. Beautiful buildings, beautiful streets, a gorgeous city. You know, it had Red Clydeside in 1919, the uprising to create a Soviet in Scotland. But it was, you know, crushed, of course. When I see cities like this, I think also about the other side of it. You know, there's a phrase from Walter Benjamin, Every monument of civilization is also a monument of barbarism. I think of the famines in Bengal, the jute workers in Bengal sending jute to Dundee through the Glasgow port. I think of human beings from Africa enslaved and brought from Ghana to the New World and all those prophets getting to the New World and all those prophets saved and brought from Ghana to the New World and all those prophets getting sucked into cities like London and Glasgow. You know, between 1765 and 1938, the British Isles stole $45 trillion of pounds from India. 45 <laughs> British Isles stole $45 trillion of pounds from India. 45 trillion sterling from India. We never got paid for that. When the British left India, when we threw the British out, our literacy rate was 13%. So much for several hundred years of so-called civilization. Meanwhile, our landscapes were destroyed. You know, coal was foisted on India. You foisted coal on us. You were the ones that came and made us coal dependent. And then you left and now you dare to condescend to us. When I listen to Boris Johnson, when I listen to people like Joe Biden, when I listen even more to Emmanuel Macron, all I can think of is how condescending you are. You condescended to us 400 years ago. You condescended to us 300 years ago. You condescended to us 200 years ago. You condescended to us 100 years ago. You're condescending to us today. You only know condescension because for you, Colonialism isn't something that happened in the past and we defeated, we defeated you. It's not that. For you, colonialism is a permanent condition. And that permanent condition happens in two ways. There's the permanent condition of the colonial mentality. You want to lecture us. You want to tell us that we are responsible for all the problems because you'll never accept that you're the one principally to blame. You signed the Rio formula in 1992 on common and differentiated responsibilities. You like the common part. You like the common part. You like to say we're all in this together and so on. We're not in this together. The United States, four or 5% of the world's population still uses 25% of the world's resources. You outsource production to China and then you say China is the carbon polluter. China's producing your buckets China is producing your nuts and bolts. China is producing your phones. Try to produce it in your own countries and see your carbon emissions rise. You love lecturing us because you have a colonial mentality. Then there are colonial structures and institutions. You lend us money and every time you lend us money, which is our money, which is our money. Every time the International Monetary Fund comes to our societies and they tell us, here's the money we are giving you. We are giving you. No, it's our money. You give us our money back as debt and then you lecture us about how we should live. It's extraordinary. It's not just a colonial mentality. It's a colonial structures and institutions which reproduce themselves year after year after year. And let me tell you something. The climate justice movement not clued enough, in, enough on this, not clued enough on this. The climate justice movement is a movement that says we're worried about our future. What future? What future? Children in the African continent, in Asia, in Latin America, they don't have a future. They don't have a present. They're not worried about the future. They're worried about their present. Your slogan is we're worried about the future. What future? 
That's some middle class bourgeois Western slogan. You got to be worried about now. 2.7 billion people can't eat now. And you're telling people reduce your consumption. How does this sound to a child who hasn't eaten in days? You got a clue into this, guys. You got a clue into this. Otherwise, this movement will have no legs in the third world. No legs. Later, I'd like to tell you about the International People's Assembly, a network of 200 political organizations that we're setting up rooted in the global south. We want to tell you what our issues are. But are you willing to listen? Very good plans, I think, for the world. Thank you, VJ. Um, but there is some fundamental things that Africa don't have today that unfortunately we're racing to catch up with you. Have very good plans, I think, for the world. Um, but there is some fundamental things that Africa don't have today that unfortunately we're racing to catch up with you. Leapfrogging is good, but you gotta, there's some steps you cannot leapfrog. You have to go through them. For, for example, we didn't have home telephones in many of the African homes because we went straight up to cell phones. Today, the United States, in Asia, and recently the United Emirates, were able to build the fundamental infrastructures. And before all of that, you gotta be able to feed your people. You gotta be able to educate your people. You gotta be able to uh, go to the hospital when you're sick and find a doctor there. In many of our cities in Africa, if you go, including my home city, Dakar, if you're sick, you go to a hospital. If you don't have money, you're dead. This is serious. I just come home because my aunt was sick. Right. In three weeks, I had to pay $12,000. When majority of Africans, Senegalese, are making 70 to 80 dollars a year. We have a huge population of young people, 400 million young people in the continent under 30 years old today. No jobs, no training, no future whatsoever. Last year we lost more than 3,000 young people dying in the ocean, trying to go to chase a dream that doesn't exist in Europe. Mm -hmm. Are you following what I'm trying to say here? Our education system is crumbling. Until today, in 2017, majority of young Africans, if you leave the rural areas, are living under the tree to study a day, a day in the schools under the tree. So how can we keep those fundamental things? We don't have a good education system. We don't have a good health care system. We cannot feed ourselves. But then we want to build the grass cells, buildings, and highways, and trains, and talking about the SDGs, and then how we can do free trades with the US and Europe. Well, you gotta take care of the, it's like a, a building without a fundance, foundation, it doesn't stand. This is where my concerns are, how we can make sure we have a strong foundation first, because we're like 50 years behind. But we cannot skip that foundation and start building floors when we don't have a foundation. And all these things, from energy, to education, to agriculture. Those are the three points I believe we need to focus on before we talk about anything. And agriculture is tied into health because what you eat is who you become. We used to eat bio in Africa. That's why I'm into agriculture, training young people to go back in the land to feed our people. Because now we're buying food from Europe and all this food is refrigerated. When they come, they're selling it to us, and most of the people in Africa are getting sick today. It's cancer, all kinds of stuff we didn't have. But all of these things, it cannot be done without leadership. It brings me to the next point. And you touch on it. If you don't have leadership, you cannot implement the change we need in the continent. In Africa, the richest people in my continent are politicians. The biggest and most beautiful homes in Africa are owned by politicians. 
If you want to be wealthy, you become a politician. They're the one traveling across the world. They're the one that control the country. And I, I think until we talk about the issue also of leadership, where we have leaders who lead in the intention to serve their countries, who can make the country dream and get them to work and not wait for anyone, anybody, to come and change this country. I have not seen any country in the world that the World Bank has changed or the United Nations. I don't see it. Maybe my friend ambassador from the UN can tell me, I have not seen any country in the world that those world inter international organizations had come and changed it for them. But I've seen some countries that was changed by the children of those countries. Israel had the same issues that we had. They had genocide. They don't have the natural resources we had. How come Israel in less than 50 years, 60 years, is where they are today? It's hard work. You believe in yourself. You use the human capacity and you work. But we, depending on you, Europe, Europe and you, the United States, to come and change Africa. And I know you ain't going to do it. <laughs> because even if you give me a speech, you make me believe that, yeah, we're coming to help you change Africa. I know you're coming to for your pocket. It's normal. It's business. <laughs> it's okay. I want you to come for your pocket. But I'm just warning you here that when you come under our new leadership, under this new generation, you will come like you come into America. I don't see any foreign leader coming to the U.S., breaking the laws, trying to do business. You end up in jail. I see businesses that come to Africa don't even respect their corporate, corporate social responsibilities. They're coming in with cash, buying politicians. You do it in America, you end up in prison. But those to be able to implement those policies, you need leadership. And this is where I'm working on to train young people to the education and training through my foundation for them to understand our responsibility and what's, what we're carrying on, the legacy of the great Nkrumah and Nelson Mandela. If it wasn't for leadership, I don't think Nelson Mandela will challenge the status quo at those dark nights in South Africa. But I knew he knew that he had to lead, even if he means to sacrifice. Those pianos that was coming in America with no lights, no, no nothing at those times, taking the waters from Europe. When it was hard in Ireland, there was nothing going on in Europe. They looked to come here and find new land with nothing. In less than 200 years, they built it. But let me tell you this to close, though. In my land, we have 30% of the world's natural resources. More than anybody in the world. So if we cannot succeed, I cannot blame always the past, well, because of slavery, because, no, it's excuses. I mean, come on. We've got to change it, period. And I'm not talking to you. I'm talking about any young African watching me from wherever you are on the world. Stop blaming everybody for our problems. The past is the past. There's history about it. Okay, cool. But now we've grown. And things need to change. How, how come Emirates, I was just in Doha the other day, and I'm looking, it's like, I'm like, look at this. They have only few natural resources compared to everything in Africa. A desert is nothing, and look how they've changed it in less than 40 years. We can do that in Africa. We can do it. <laughs> I think you've sparked a lot. Wait, actually, Flory, I think... 100 million Africans live in the dark today. Half of the continent is the biggest in the world. If we don't do anything, nothing will happen. Mm. And without energy, you can't do anything. Right now, I'm talking to you, but as soon as the electricity if it was cut off in a minute, or you go home and there is no electricity or warm water, you'll be fussing and calling on somebody. Because that's something that you're used to. That's something that becomes so accustomed to your daily lives. But my friends, I'm here to tell you that in my home continent, in my home continent, in Africa, 600 millions of those people never know what lights is about. They never seen electricity before. 
I grew up into those conditions. In my grandfather's house, I had to wake up early in the morning at 6, 7 a.m. so I can catch the sun again to finish what I didn't finish on studying the night before. That's why the work we're doing is very personal to us. You know, all across the world, there is always a generation that came and dreamed and pushed the limits in this great country that we are today in the United States. There was a young president named Kennedy who dreamed of the impossible, to go to the moon and drove his country to push the limits. A young man like Dr. King did it here to allow people like President Obama and myself to do the things we did not imagine in the 60s to happen in this country. A young man in Singapore did it, Lee Kuan Yew. When Malaysia left, a country with no natural resources, today is a model of nation building. So I'm here to tell you that my generation, the generation of Akon, the generation of Samba Bachili, the generation of Dangote, Chon Young, and his generation. We know nothing about slavery. We know nothing about independence, even though we acknowledge the work that our funding fathers has done. I know, and I know that. When Krumah and Krumah was dreaming about the unification of Africa, when Patrice Lumumba were talking about a change in control of our economic models in the continent, when Sekouture and Senghor finish school in Europe and go back to liberate our countries in Africa, such as Senegal, my home country. I knew they knew they would not finish the work. And I knew they knew the sacrifices they were making were not for them. It was for another generation to come. It was for their children and their grandchildren. Their grandchildren is here. I'm here. We're here. And I'm here to tell you that this generation will transform the continent. Mm -hmm. We know the challenges. We've traveled the world. We've seen it. We've traveled the world. We understood the world. We've traveled the world. We know how nations are built. And we are looking for partners like you who will come to our continent in a win-win situation. But a new leadership, a new wave of change is flooding on the skies of the continent. And it will become the best of the best and nothing but the best. This is why Akan and I are sacrificing to make sure we bring energy in the continent. This is why in my Jeff Zone project, yesterday at this time, I was in my farms with young people helping me to play our part in making sure that we feed our people. We have 35% of edible land in the continent, yet we spend 35 billion US dollars importing food in our continent. I want to do something about that. And my generation will, will change that. So it is to tell you that we are concerned, but we're optimistic because the challenge is high, but we really take on the challenges. And as our funding fathers, we know if we don't finish to see what we're working for, the young people that I am training through Give One Project, the young people that Tony Elemelu is training through the Tony Elemelu Foundation, the young people we're training through the Solar Academy, a canonized Solar Academy, and etc., and etc., and etc. I am pretty sure they will take on the fight and they will change the continent. But for now, where we are, we are doing what we can and what we can't. And to invite the diaspora to know that Africa will not change without them. Their expertise is needed in the continent until we come to do our part, it will not be the Africa we dream about. And I know you're telling me the time is up, but I wish you gave me 30 more minutes. <laughs> thank you so much for the introduction. So thank you. We need more like you. Thank and you. that's what I'm talking about. All right. Going back to what I was saying about no amount of education 
can change you unless your mind is in the right place. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine if we can just have a few more Africans like him? Mm. <laughs> and that's what we're talking about, that we need Africans who get it. A leader is as good as the people he is leading. So I am challenging the diaspora to say, don't just sit back and shoot out complaints. Don't be an empty bucket that's making noise. You got to get involved. So the diaspora, if you're listening, we need you to go home <laughs> and participate in the process. That's true. Because the truth is, for true change to come to Africa, it has to be brought by the Africans.